uh, good morning, Doctor. Great to have you on our program, The Business Detective. To begin, what are some of the challenges faced by the health sector currently? Uh, thank you, uh, Dinesh, um, for inviting me to uh, talk this morning. I think um, the um, uh, biggest challenge that the health sector is facing now is the uh, manpower issue. Uh, because uh, even uh, just before I, um, you know, joined this um, uh, webinar, I got another resignation. So, uh, you know, it is um, sad that uh, the um, uh, professionals of this country are leaving the country for greener pastures. And uh, these are professionals um, on whom we have uh, invested um, from cradle, as it were, in the you know, school, undergraduate, postgraduate, and so on. So we need to um, really find a solution to keep our professionals in this country and work for our country. And the health sector is one of those where we cannot um, you know, lose people who we have invested for a long, long time um, uh, without uh, you know, continuing service. So that to me is the biggest uh, challenge. Then of course, um, the next challenge is maintaining supply chains because it is not just a challenge uh, for Sri Lanka. If you look at the, all the countries around the world, because of my work with the Commonwealth, I know last week um, I was at the Commonwealth Advisory Committee on Health meeting at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. Maintaining supply chains is a challenge for everyone, especially for small countries who don't have large volumes of um, uh, you know, consumables that they need. So to command a price, that is affordable to them, uh, that makes healthcare uh, affordable to their people is becoming challenge, uh, becoming a challenge. So working towards uh, mechanisms of pool procurement, uh, small countries coming together in various uh, you know, economic blocks or um, political blocks as it were, and commanding, uh, uh, commanding volumes that ensure that the supply chains are maintained is so very important. So to me, I think those are the two main challenges uh, that we are facing now. Uh, and it is not just Sri Lanka challenge. It's a, a global challenge. And it is also in terms of uh, manpower, it is a commonwealth challenge because we all speak English. And uh, as a result of that, the um, uh, developing uh, English speaking countries are the most hit through the um, uh, because of the um, uh, migration of healthcare workforce. And we are now these days talking about ethical migration and how can that migration be made ethically um, acceptable so that not only uh, the receiving country benefit, but uh, the giving country does not uh, you know, suffer and their health services are decimated. So these to me are the two main challenges that we are facing Dinesh. Yeah. Doctor, you raised this issue about uh, talent retention. What can the government of Sri Lanka do in collaboration with your association to retain some of the top talent in the country? Even that doctors really make a lot of money through their practice locally. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you talk to um, uh, people who have gone away, I mean, it's not just the, um, uh, it's just not an economic issue. It's a social issue, uh, right? Uh, so um, basically, all of us, I think the doctors would like to work eight to four and uh, make a decent living uh, without having to work uh, and burn the midline, midnight oil. And um, so when you talk, when I talk to my colleagues who have gone away, uh, what they say is, look, uh, uh, you know, here we work eight to four, uh, make a decent living. And uh, the rest of the time, we have for our families, our friends, for, to pursue other pursuits and so on. So uh, the uh, why doctors are leaving the country is burnout. Right? To me, it's a a burnout issue, uh, which is, um, you know, frustrating them because uh, uh, really you would say, Dinesh, I mean, nobody wants to work 24 hours a day, right? You would like to uh, uh, spend uh, uh, spend um, uh, time with your family, uh, you know, leisure pursuits and others. 
and uh, so uh, uh, so the doctors are really uh, you know coming to a realization that there is more to life than uh, uh, you know the practice during daytime in government private practice in the afternoon uh, and burning the midline oil uh, looking for money uh, so as a result of that if you look at um, those who have migrated um, you would see the top practitioners in the country the top earners are also migrating so it's not an economic issue. It's a social issue. It's a family issue. It's uh, at the end of the day, uh, they know that um, uh, their well-being is um, uh, is affected. And uh, so we have to look at all of these issues and uh, look at a comprehensive, um, uh, you know, solution. And uh, that solution is, I think, a social, societal solution uh, rather than an economic solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, doctor, given the fact that we spend a huge amount of uh, the taxpayers' money on uh, the medical service, what are some of the options we have for prevention? Are we doing enough? Right. So, um, if you look at um, uh, where we are heading now, uh, Dinesh, like uh, if you look at what we call the burden of disease, uh, the uh, highest burden of disease is on... Uh, uh, on um, uh, chronic disorders, what we call the non-communicable non disorders. So the non-communicable disorders, diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, stroke, and all of that uh, is um, taking a heavy burden uh, on our population. So that is um, uh, something that we need to address. And all of those can be prevented through life lifestyle interventions. Um, so that is uh, a must. Uh, so primary prevention is the goal there. And uh, what is um, uh, making all of us, uh, you know, acquire these illnesses is uh, our lifestyle. We all have, uh, you know, what we call a genetic predisposition to these conditions. But the expression of these is brought on by the junk food, bad habits, smoking, alcohol, sedentary lifestyle, environmental pollution, and so on. So when I talk about this, you can see that all of these are non-medical interventions. Uh, that uh, So the health services are overburdened uh, due to a complete lifestyle change. Now, I, I tell my students in 1991, uh, uh, 90, uh, 91, when I went first to uh, my medical appointment at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, my, my appointment with, was with uh, um, a senior uh, physician called Dr. Henry Rajaratnam. And uh, Dr. Rajaratnam was the top uh, physician for endocrine disorders at that time. And his ward had just one patient with diabetes. And uh, all of us, uh, you know, the group of 20 students were clamoring to, you know, see this one patient with diabetes. Today, if you go to the National Hospital, uh, you know, wards are 90%, I would say, will be patients with diabetes and complications of diabetes. Uh, so what changed between 1991 and uh, uh, 2022, uh, 23, uh, in the 30 years, it is our lifestyle. You know, the junk food, the bad habits, smoking, alcohol, environment pollution, and uh, everything else that came uh, came about. So we need to reverse these through social interventions. And I think that is where uh, the world is heading. The second aspect that we have to keep in mind is the fact that uh, we are an aging population. We knew this. Uh, 30 years ago, I can remember two, uh, the year 2000 as a younger, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, year 2000, 20 years ago, I can remember as a young, uh, you know, uh, lecturer in the university, uh, I was uh, called to uh, economic, uh, Sri Lanka economic summit uh, or something like that, uh, where, for which I was invited and I went and I got up and there and they were, the economists all were talking about, uh, you know, uh, the threats and uh, threats to our economy. I, I, I got up and at that meeting said, we have to acknowledge the fact that we are the second fastest aging population at that time behind um, uh, Japan. 
and we are aging with a much lower GDP. And uh, how are we going to care for these elderly people in the future? Uh, it is very, very valid now. Uh, we have an uh, aging population um, who are, uh, you know, stuck with conditions like dementia, um, uh, then uh, also conditions like, uh, you know, Parkinson's disease, uh, stroke and others, which need uh, long-term care, rehabilitation, and care outside the health, care, health services in the community. So we need uh, to look at that. And also post-COVID, we have the issue of um, uh, we have the issue of um, the uh, mental health conditions, and that also needs community intervention. So the care services at the moment in our country, outside of the health services, are very poorly structured, and we need to address the care services, and that is so very important. And for the elderly population, with the young migrating, loneliness is becoming a huge issue. As you know, if you take uh, developed countries like, uh, in, the U in Europe, if you take London or you know, Paris or uh, Amsterdam or wherever, they say 30 to 40% are single people living in a house. So in fact, in Britain, they have now a minister for loneliness. Uh, so uh, you know, these things uh, will also hit us. And uh, we are, our social care services are poorly uh, equipped to deal with this. So we really need to uh, look at these transitions uh, in the uh, both the burden of disease as well as the demographic transition, which is making our people, uh, we have a large elderly population that needs care and take cognizance of these and restructure our services, not just healthcare services, uh, but also the care services outside of the health services that need to support this because um, it is uh, becoming uh, a too big uh, uh, problem just to be uh, managed by the healthcare, uh, healthcare staff. Uh, doctor, given your international experience, would a residency program help to bring back some of these doctors uh, living overseas? Yeah, uh, so now um, uh, the um, uh, uh, Dinesh, uh, you know, healthcare services is not just doctors. Uh, it is um, also the other, uh, other, other groups as well. So we need the nurses, uh, we need the paramedics, the physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and, you know, all that lot. So we need to create a mechanism where we produce more as well as retain them, and those who have gone back, bring them uh, back. Because currently, it's just not only the, uh, the doctors migrating, we have large numbers of other categories also migrating, especially nurses, and that is a threat to us. So we need to create that ecosystem where, the, uh, where those who have gone can come back, as well as we can produce more and, and we can retain them. So that is what will make us sustainable in the future. Uh, doctor, given the controversy we have had in the supply chain, how do we improve the governance in the supply chain in the medical uh, health industry? Yes, that is um, a big challenge. Um, uh, so I think uh, I mean, that's not an area that I've been involved in. So that's not an area that I've been uh, giving thought to. But um, uh, as uh, even uh, at our previous, uh, you know, the Commonwealth Advisory Committee on Health meeting last week uh, in London, we discussed about this. I think uh, pool procurement uh, centrally managed uh, through organizations such as the World Health Organization or the Commonwealth, for that matter, uh, would be uh, uh, would be good. And I think uh, World Health Organization is a too big organization. But um, if you look at, for example, the Commonwealth, Commonwealth probably uh, would be ideally placed for that. And uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, the reason for that is uh, the Commonwealth consists of 56 nations, 36 of them are, um, you know, small island states. And actually, if you look at um, the whole lot, as it were, uh, more than uh, nearly 50 of them 
are still developing countries. So if you like as a block, uh, you know, bring about a pool procurement mechanism centrally administered uh, through the Commonwealth, uh, you know, in London, I think we will be in a very good place and we can, uh, you know, overcome these challenges that we are facing now. And um, I guess uh, with uh, the, um, uh, you know, uh, the diplomatic, um, uh, you know, um, powers that our uh, uh, President, His Excellency, uh, uh, hold uh, with the Commonwealth, I know he's uh, very well uh, received in the Commonwealth. Uh, we, I would uh, think that we should take the leadership in impressing on uh, the uh, Secretariat to take this up. This is something that the uh, Commonwealth Advisory Committee on Health has been working uh, for a long time, and I'm sure uh, we can prevail on them uh, to um, uh, in introduce a formal mechanism, um, and we can discuss how we uh, take that initiative forward. We, having been a member of the Commonwealth Advisory Committee on Health for the past, uh, like almost now six years, um, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, uh, uh, facilitate such a mechanism for Sri Lanka. Doctor, my final question to you is, uh, given the fact that you are a very experienced medical professional, what is your advice to young doctors? Well, um, you know, uh, Dinesh, I've been um, uh, telling uh, my, uh, the, what I tell my uh, students in the faculty, as you know, I'm the Dean of the Colombo Medical Faculty as well. So they are, uh, what I've been telling uh, the uh, uh, young doctors is that uh, if uh, what is taking them um, abroad is, uh, uh, is um, you know, a fear of the future, uh, fear of the financial stability of the future, I tell them to Google, uh, you know, economic center of gravity of the world and they see this map made by McKinsey which shows that the economic, um, uh, you know, center of gravity is shifting to the east. So uh, we, in the next, uh, you know, uh, a few decades, uh, we will be in the uh, powerhouse of the world if uh, those projections are correct. And in fact, um, uh, about a month ago, we had the um, uh, president of JICA giving a talk at the uh, University of Colombo, where he showed exactly the same thing with data showing that the economic um, you know, uh, 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 powerhouse of the future is going to be South and Southeast Asia. Uh, and so, and then we know that India is forging ahead, becoming uh, maybe the third largest economy in, uh, in, a, uh, in the not so near future. Uh, so we are going, uh, so if it is an economic uh, factors that's taking them away, uh, they always say it's for the future of our children, but their children's future will be secure being here, working for this country and um, and 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 uh, and doing their duty. So I always try to impress upon them a sense of duty and service uh, to the country. And I think we need to create a, um, a create a sense of security for them uh, that things will be all right for the future. And we need to start a dialogue where we uh, create that sense of security uh, for people that we need to stay and build our country and take it to the next level. And this is where we are going to, uh, uh, where we will, I think, uh, convince them uh, to stay and work for our country and uh, build our country. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vajita. Great talking to you. You're welcome, Dinesh. Thank you.